Have you ever met someone who makes you feel really special? Someone who listens intentionally, someone who helps you to believe you're capable of anything and everything? Someone who speaks the truth in love, someone who speaks the truth in times when it's hard to see the truth. That was my friend and mentor, Alan Lurvey. He was so special. And as his own granddaughter said, special people are the people who make other people feel special. Yesterday, as we celebrated his life, his chosen scripture for the service that he planned for himself, being a pastor and all, he had it all planned out, was the scripture that we are sharing today. This scripture is a much beloved passage. It's part of the prophecy of the prophet Micah. And in this passage, God is addressing Israel. And in the preceding verses, before we get to what uh, Bob so nicely read this morning, it's almost like it's a court case. And we, the people, are on trial. Having not followed through with our promises to God and God's promise, you know, to fulfill God's promises to us, God is saying, I've done, look at these things I've done for you. And, and the people of Israel are saying, well, what is it? What is it that you want? You want my firstborn child? The animal sacrifices? And of course we know, no, it's not what God is looking for. Not those religious activities. This is about living relationships. With the first and most important one being our relationship with God. The Lord calls on Israel to act with justice and to do what is right and in good and good in God's sight. Yes, indeed, God requires us to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God. But when we think about doing justice, we often think about the legal systems in the courts. But the kind of justice that God requires of us goes beyond the letter of the law because sometimes laws aren't right. Sometimes our laws hurt people. Sometimes our laws are more about the people who made our laws than anything else. The kind of justice in Micah that we're talking about today is about treating others with fairness and compassion and standing up for those who are marginalized and oppressed. It's about being a voice for the voiceless and fighting for righteousness in our world, but fighting with love. Yes, Micah calls us to walk humbly with God. To walk humbly with God is to recognize our own limitations and imperfections. It's to follow God's will and God's ways. It's about recognizing that we aren't in control. It's about following God, trusting God, even when we don't understand God's ways at all. Living a life characterized by justice, mercy, and humility. That is what my friend Alan did. And he honestly, sincerely did it 24-7. As I said, he was someone who made everyone feel special. It wasn't really until yesterday that I sat and listened to story after story after story that he really made everyone feel special. That I wasn't the only one who felt special. And more than that, he was truly one of the most joyful people I have known. With a glint in his blue eyes, always ready with a smile and a nod and a hug if you wanted one or needed one. It's not easy to live that way though, is it? 
We are called to live that way. We're called to be the hands and feet of Jesus in this world, to show love and compassion and kindness to others, and to put our trust in God. I know I'm just repeating what I just said, but it bears repeating. Because if it were that easy, I probably wouldn't need to be here talking about it. It's harder than we think sometimes. And as we have been talking about our spiritual gifts, and hopefully you all got the paper from from our wonderful welcome team at the door, that is, um, I've been sending you some different things about your spiritual gifts. For those of you that are part of our um, email distribution list, you got one a couple weeks ago that was an online little spiritual gifts assessment. But I know that not everyone pays attention to their emails or has emails. So today you got one in paper form that you can fill out, and I'd love to hear what your results are. And if you already filled out the other one, I'd love to hear if your results are slightly different, because they are slightly different. So when we think about our spiritual gifts, we might say, well, let's, you know, I don't think that um, doing justice and loving mercy and walking with humility is, are, those aren't my spiritual gifts, so I guess I'm off the hook, right? <laughs> it's different. That is a call from God. What does God require from us, all of us? God requires those things from us. It's the way in which we do those things that we use our spiritual gifts, right? Our gifts may be different. I think if I, you know, I can look around and, and I think about Elaine, you know, many of you know her spiritual gift or one of them, right? You get your daily devotional every day from Elaine Pratt. We know that one of her spiritual gifts is writing. And she shares that with us. Deb Groshmo, who was here, she, she runs a thrift shop. And I, can, I could look around and keep going and, and, and calling out spiritual gifts, but you get the gist. We do justice. We love mercy and walk humbly with our God as we use our spiritual gifts. It's overwhelming sometimes, though. Because the amount of work in this world and the problems we face are vast. There's so much to do, and it's overwhelming. Where do we even start? Calling again on my experience in um, celebrating my friend yesterday. I want to call on the prayer of uh, Oscar Romeo. And listen as I share these words with you. It helps now and then to step back and take a long view. The kingdom is not only beyond our effort, efforts, it's even beyond our vision. We accomplish in our lifetime only a tiny fraction of the magnificent enterprise that is God's work. Nothing we do is complete, which is a way of saying that the kingdom always lays just beyond us. No one statement says all that could be said. No one prayer fully expresses our faith. No confession brings perfection. No pastoral visit brings wholeness. No program accomplishes the church's mission. No set of goals and objectives includes everything. This is what we're about. We plant seeds that one day will grow. We water seeds already planted, knowing that they hold future promise. We lay foundations that will need further development. We provide yeast that produces effects far beyond our capabilities. We cannot do everything. And there's a sense of liberation in realizing that because this enables us to do something and to do it very well. It may be incomplete, but it is a beginning, a step along the way, an opportunity for the Lord's grace to enter and do the rest. We may never see the end results, but that is the difference between the master builder and the worker. We are workers, not master builders. Ministers, not messiahs. We are prophets of a future that is not our own. We may not see the fruit of our labor, but we are planting seeds. We are watering seeds. Wise words spoken hundreds of years ago. Wise words repeated. 
When it comes to loving mercy, we often think about being kind and compassionate to each other and to others. But our call from God goes a bit beyond that. It's about actively seeking out opportunities to show mercy to others, even when it's difficult or uncomfortable. It's about standing with those who are hurting and being a source of hope and healing in their lives. Later this afternoon, at 4 o'clock, we have a Guatemala mission team meeting. On February 25th, 17 of us are going to be going to Guatemala to spend eight days trying to do exactly this. To serve. To be fully present. To be fully open. To listen more than we talk. And oftentimes, we learn far more than we ever teach. To be present. To build relationships to be eyes that see another person's pain, to be ears that hear another person's pain. Sometimes that's one of the most important things we can do. We want so much to solve one another's problems. Sometimes it's relationship, the seeing and the hearing, being present letting one know that I hear you and you matter. I heard a story about mercy I wanted to share. And it goes something like this. God called a meeting in heaven. And now this was an in-person meeting. It was not a Zoom call. And invited to the meeting was love. Love was there, and joy was there, and grace, of course, was there, and patience, and peace was there, too. All the fruits of the Spirit were there in heaven to meet with God. And God was about to begin that meeting. Here, here, let's go. But grace said, oh, hold on, God, we're still waiting on mercy. Can you give him a minute or two? So God, of course, being God, said, sure. A couple of minutes went by, and God was about to get started again. Here, here. And as Grace looked out the window, looking for mercy, Grace said, Oh, God, I can see mercy coming now. Mercy is almost here. So mercy was coming in hot, pushing the door wide open and walking into the room. She smelled like smoke. Her clothes were all torn apart. She was covered in blood, and she was drenched in water. God looked at Mercy and said, where have you been? And Mercy said, well, you know, I was on my way to this meeting. And, and, and God said, no, 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 Mercy. Where have you been? Why are you dripping in water and covered in blood? And Mercy, all breathless and as exasperated, said, Lord, I was on my way to this meeting. But I heard a young couple cry out, Lord, have mercy. So I stepped in, I pulled them in their sunken canoe from that frigid water. I pulled them to safety. That's why I was late to this meeting, God. Please forgive me. And God said, okay, I understand the water, but mercy, you smell awful. Why do you smell like smoke? <sighs> so she continues, well, as I told you, I was on my way to this meeting, and I, you know, I got a real early start because I promised myself I wasn't going to be late today, but I heard an old woman cry out and say, Lord, Lord, have mercy. So I stepped in alongside of her, inside of her fiery home, and I kept that fire and those flames away from her all night long and held her close. God said, okay, but I, I guess I have to ask, why is it that your clothes are all ripped apart and you're covered in blood? What's going on? And Mercy says, Lord, I promise you, I, I really was on my way to this meeting, but I heard a man calling out from a shelter that was being bombarded by heavy artillery, and that man said, Lord, have mercy. So 
So I stayed there. I stayed there atop of that shelter, pushing that art artillery away, keeping that man and his young ma family safe. And then Mercy looked at God and said, you know, we better hurry up with this meeting because there's somebody right there in New Market, New Hampshire, calling out, Lord, have mercy. The person is struggling to hold on to mercy, struggling to love their neighbor, struggling to walk in their faith, struggling to get through all the challenges that are before them. And Lord, they are calling me right now to lift them up and to encourage them to live a life of mercy where justice rolls down and your love, God, your love, oh God, is lifted on high. We better hurry up with this meeting. I've got work to do. May we be empowered by our God of mercy, grace, peace, joy, and hope, and do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with our God. May it be so, my friends. May it be so.